Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our session, second session in our week-long activities of, um, of celebrating the Global Entrepreneurship Week. This afternoon, we have an exciting topic, which um, myself and the panelists and everybody at JBDC are extra passionate about. Um, we're going to be talking about something that is near and dear to the hearts of every single Jamaican, we believe, even if you don't know it by the name that we know it by, it's near and dear to the hearts of all of us. We're talking about social entrepreneurship. And this afternoon, we're talking in particularly how it is that we can unlock youth innovation through the vehicle of social enterprise, social entrepreneurship. That's what we're talking about this afternoon. I want to, right off the top, recognize our partners who have come together intellectually and otherwise, and some of them are here physically, um, to help us to present this session. Um, and I speak of the British Council, and I speak of the uh, stock exchange, and in particular, the social stock exchange of Jamaica. Um, to talk about this very exciting topic this afternoon, and to really bring some energy and some life to this whole business about social entrepreneurship, and in, and in particular, um, how it is that youth un entrepreneurs can look towards social entrepreneurship, and what in particular they need to understand about the space. We have an exciting panel, a uh, very informed and educated panel, a panel that has been in the trenches and been there, done that for a while. Um, so this afternoon, let me just share with you that the afternoon, we're going to be divided into two sections. The first section, we're going to have a panel discussion in which I'm going to ask each, other, uh, each of our panelists to give a five minutes um, overview on their take on the topic. And then we're going to open the room for discussion because that's what we want, discussion on the, um, on the topic. And, and really any question that you want to ask in regards to the social entrepreneurship and youth development. And in the second section of the afternoon, we're going to have what we call a youth innovation marketplace, where we're going to highlight some youth who have been doing some fabulous things in the social entrepreneurship space who have been doing it. So yes, it is happening for those of you who are now being introduced to the whole business of social entrepreneurship for the very first time. Let me let you know that it is happening. It is in fact happening. As a matter of fact, just recently before I introduced my panelists, I was in conversation with one of our panelists, my good friend Seretsi Small, about the whole business of the my headspace, the mindset of our youth, and the, and the fact that our youth, more and more, our millennia and our Generation Zs, are looking more and more to the social entrepreneurship space, even subconsciously, yeah? even before they look at for-profit businesses. But we're going to explore all of that and much more this afternoon. So let me, without further ado, I'm going to welcome and introduce for you our panel of experts who are going to share with us um, this afternoon. Uh, to my immediate left, probably your right, um, is Dr. Kadamawi Naif. Now, Dr. Naif wears several, several hats. Not sure which one of the hats. Them <laughs> them not a hat on this afternoon. Normally, I've had a time, but them not a hat on this afternoon. But he wears several, several hats. And the hat that he's going to come to, I'm not even sure, I, I, I don't want to put him in a box, but the hat that I think is on paper that he's going to come to us about this morning is he's a director for, uh, for a center for entrepreneurship thinking and practice. And of course, um, those of you who know Knife, he is very, very involved in the social enterprise sector and not only is a doer, but also a thought leader in the space as well. Um, to Knife's left, we have the lovely and the only lady on the panel this afternoon, Olivia Sinclair. Now, Olivia is one of our business development officers at the, here, right here at the Jamaica Business Development Corporation. Now, let her young looks um, 
um, folio. She's, she's deep in terms of her experience and her, ex and her exposure in entrepreneurship development, having been here a while, don't it, Olivia? Yeah, you start work for me for the tree, but she has, she has, been, here, she has been here a while with us um, at JBDC. So welcome, Olivia. Looking forward to um, your comments. Now, Andre, I'm not sure if Andre is online from the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Yes, sir. Also, <coughs> he is. I, I hear your voice. Well. Good afternoon, yes, Andre. Yes, I'm very much here, sir. Good afternoon, right, everybody. Great one. Um, Andre is from the Jamaica Stock Exchange. I mentioned earlier that they were one of our substantive partners in, um, in, in the thought leadership space in social entrepreneurship in Jamaica. And earlier this year, we had a round table discussion on social entrepreneurship um, and social enterprise sector generally with um, the Stock Exchange as our partner. Andre, welcome and looking forward to remarks from you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Sure. Um, Damien Mitchell. Damien, I know Mitchell, you didn't ask him. Campbell, of course. <laughs> Damien Campbell is the acting country director at the British Council and British Council. He will share with you the programs that the British Council has in place for social entrepreneurship. Um, they have been doing some really good work in that regard. And also he will share with you his perspective on the whole business of youth in social entrepreneurship. And we left the most handsome for the last, not really, but I'm just saying so because he's my friend <laughs> and we probably need to be having wine at, at, at some point later. I don't want, him, don't want to dig into that at all. My good friend, Mr. Suretsi Small, he is the head of Avant Academy of Music, which is a social enterprise that has been around for, is it four years? Seven years. Seven years, seven years, seven years. And he will share with you what Avant Academy of Music is doing and more so. He will share with you his perspective on the space and what his lessons learned have been to date, because you're still learning yeah, and growing uh, as well. Um, we're looking forward to your comments. So let's jump straight into it. Knife, you are up first, and I want, I want to, for you to just share with us your perspective of the growth prospects of the social enterprise in Jamaica, and of course the cross-section with youth entrepreneurs and, and, and certainly innovation. Um, the floor is yours, Knife. All right, let me just start by saying, once you hear the word, SDG, Sustainable Development Goal, that is speaking specifically to social entrepreneurship, because the SDGs have three key elements, you know, economic development, social development, biodiversity slash environmental development. So all those 17 goals are captured. So the SDG operates at the macro level. The social enterprise operates at the micro level. So the SDGs might be the ideation stage, as you see with the thing here with, the, with ideate, innovate, and activate. So the SDGs is at the ideation stage. The social enterprise is at the innovation and activation stage. Yes? So there is no way we can attain the SDGs without the social entrepreneurship platform. Importantly, you don't set long-term goals for people who are not going to be around in the long run. You set long-term goals for youths who are here now, and they are going to be the ones who actually actualize those goals as well through their own actions. So again, fundamentally, achieving the SDGs, the precondition is that so we must be able to create a platform that allows the creativity and innovativeness of our youths to just explode. Now, importantly again, COVID, COVID can be a blessing in disguise, you know, even though we know that there are some challenges. But the reality is that what COVID has done is that A, it shows that we cannot use the same approach of selfish self-interest to get out of the problem. Secondly, it shows that we need a different form of innovation to bring the good or service to the market. Will it be a process innovation, like also people now thinking about how we make good our services? We're going to look a lot more on, on 3D printing, or are still going to have people inside the space making these products. Will it be a distribution innovation? Are we going to use drones to deliver what we want to do? You know, are we going to create what you call virtual tourism platform as against face-to-face -to -face tourism platform? Is it, I mean, there are so many different forms of innovation, and the reality is we know that as one ages, unlike Miss Vido, 
You know, Miss Visa is an exception. As one ages, they tend to be less innovative and less creative. So without any doubt, if we are going to find the innovation that we need to move the country forward, we have to look directly towards these youths. And as Earl has mentioned, remember these youths, what we call the millennials, or what people want to call the indigo children, if you look at their characteristic, they're not only the entrepreneurial generation, but they're the social entrepreneurial generation. But because of the, the, the abundance of information, and access to information, some of those lies that people used to tell young people, yes, the divides that were created because of time and space and place no longer exist. And these youths know that the same air that we breathe here in Jamaica is connected to the air that somebody else breathes in the next space. So yeah, we are called collective responsibility in the actions. So while they are driven and motivated by profit, you know, they are not motivated by the selfish self-interest. They recognize that profit and money have functions, and the function of the money must be to improve the quality of lives of persons around us. So they have already bought into the idea. And we don't want to jump on demand thing, but we know that the research has shown from the British Council that we have a strong culture towards giving back in the high schools from different clubs and societies. What was missing is how they sustain, sustain that kind of mindset, which is the enterprise element. And we have seen where our programs are established to do just that. So really, I think that the, the landscape is ready for these young persons. The question is that whether we as adults are ready for these young persons. And that might be a more difficult question to answer. To my turn, turn. Correct. Yeah. As usual, really strong words from, from, from my friend, got him out of a knife still. Um, you know, the difference, you know, in, in this age, we were having a discussion earlier at the office, and this age, it is a global norm for businesses that are moving and are growing to hug up and to adapt the triple P bottom line, which is profit, planet, and people. So, and, the, and, and many entities see it as part of their business model, but they see it as a CSR. <laughs> it's different as a social enterprise when profit, planet, and people mean a different thing to you. And for social enterprises, there is a fourth P, fourth P that is added to the mix, and that is purpose. And it's driven by your purpose, profit, planet, and your people. So let's talk about what is particular about the support, Olivia, that we provide to enterprises, generally speaking. How do we see our support as JBDC for social enterprises and basically what it is that we, 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 are, we are looking for from our social enterprises? All right, good afternoon, everyone. So, in terms of social entrepreneurship and looking at some of the things that will influence the ability for youth to innovate in social entrepreneurship, the first thing I'd want to say is that social entrepreneurship is not something that's new. It has been going on forever. And now with the generations coming up, the millennials, Generation Z, we are people who are interested in driving positive change, purpose, change, innovation are important to us. But this has been something that we have been doing forever as a country, as a nation, as a people. You see it in the community groups, you see it in the religious organizations, you'll see it in the school groups, so alumni associations. And what has been happening largely is that we have been looking at it as a model of charity. So a lot of persons tend to base their social output or their social goods in charity. And over time, a lot more people have been finding that this has been unsustainable. So what do they do? A lot of these groups, they have fundraisers. If you're in an alumni, they'll sell t-shirts and they'll sell armbands. And these are ways that people have been trying to sustain whatever social or economic or um, environmental good that they're trying to do. So 
one of the things that's going to be important is that we transition from charity to enterprise. So we have to find a way to move from a donation model into an enterprising model. And the social enterprise model has been the way that people have been doing that for ages. Now it's more of a case where people are trying to formalize, they're trying to be more effective, they're trying to maximize impact. And so we have been transitioning from charity to enterprise. Now, what is important to note is that a social enterprise is based usually in purpose. So what is the purpose of this enterprise? It can be social. Are you a group of LGBTQ persons who are trying to get equity in the workplace? Is it environmental? Are you young people who are trying to protect the environment, trying to bring awareness to things like what is happening in St. Anne? Are you a group of persons who are focused on economics? So you're trying to develop um, jobs for young people, more advancement, more education, and you're doing this through employment. What is it? What are the problems that you are trying to solve? And when you start from there, then you'll be able to build. Uh, when you start from the problem, you'll be able to find a solution and you can do that through enterprising. Now, any single problem that you think of or group of problems, there will likely be a business model for that. So this is where the support of organizations like JBDC come in. With whether it is that you are trying to transition from a charity or you're going straight into social entrepreneurship, the enterprising aspect of it is usually where most people struggle. So how is it that you're going to take this good that you're trying to do and build a model around it so that it is sustainable, so that you can earn in order to accomplish this goal. You'll need a business model. Now, some examples of business models that persons can consider, and this is on a spectrum. Some people might think more of an enterprising side. So for example, is what you're doing in the business wrapped up in the good that you're doing? So for example, um, Def Can Coffee is a good example for me because in running Def Can Coffee, they help to accomplish their mission, which is to empower um, deaf people, deaf individuals, deaf young people, and allow them to work, to have purpose, to be able to lift themselves up. They do that entirely through their model. There are other models now where the enterprising activity is not at all related to the social good that you're doing. So I can't think of an example off the top of my head. It's usually um, very connected, but maybe like Tom's shoes. So when you purchase a pair of shoes from them, the revenue that they make from that, they put that into programs, they put that into scholarships. So the enterprising activity is, is a bit separated from the purpose, but the funds are used to propel the purpose. Now, the social enterprise ecosystem has a lot going on in Jamaica now. There's a lot being developed where it's concerned. There's the MSME policy, which has now been rewritten to include social enterprise. So it will come in as a category. There are still things that there are benefits that you can get from registering as a social enterprise, um, similar to what would happen with charities, except it would recognize that what you're doing is not a charity, you're running a business and so there will be profit. So it helps to deal with some of those things. So that is being rolled out. As well as the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange, which is something that we'll hear a little bit more about later. But in a nutshell, it's like crowdfunding in a way. It's, it's, it's like crowdfunding. So they will go more into it, but that is something that is being rolled out too. You have a lot of international donor agencies now looking to fund social enterprise. And then you have persons in the space like JBDC who, are, who is here to help develop the enterprising aspect of it, to help you plan to write your proposals, to, to look at your business model, so that when you are going to the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange, you have the things in order. When you're pitching to the donor agencies, you have everything in order. So the ecosystem is coming along. 
Now, finally, what I want to say is that social entrepreneurship is serious business. A lot of people might see it and think that because it's coming from a place of good that it's not serious. But social entrepreneurs have to be just as serious or even more serious than other enterprises because what you do matters. It affects these social problems, these environmental problems, these economic problems. And in order a lot of times to get funding, you have to be formalized, you have to be tax compliant, you have to have your proposal documents. All these different things have to be in place in order to make you as effective as you can be. Now, in solving society's problems, it's also important to note that it's not just a government thing. Everybody has a role to play. The government alone cannot address all of the issues that we have as a nation. Every single person has to get involved and business and social entrepreneurship has to play a large role in bringing society forward. Now, if it is that you're interested in getting the support of the JBDC, if you're already a client of us, please reach out to your business development office and let them know that you are looking for support. If you don't already have a business development officer, please email us. You can email the two emails on the screen. You can email nmackenzie at jbdc.net or rbottle at jbdc.net and ask them to become a client. We also have offices island-wide. I'm going to give the plug. I have to give the plug. We have offices island-wide. So we have two in Kingston, one in Manchester, one in West Milan, one in St. James, one in St. Anne, and one in St. Thomas. So please feel free to check us out on social media. Reach out to us if you're trying to take your social enterprise to the next level. Thank you. Yeah, my feet say we should applaud right in us too, because she, she go on good. <laughs> very proud of you, Olivia. Very, very proud of you. And Olivia said something which is critical to our conversation. And she says that social enterprise is serious business. It's not, as a matter of fact, it is not easy to do good as your mission. It is not easy. Um, some will argue that it might be easier just to do well, yeah? So it's not easy, it's, it's, it's tough for sterner stuff, it's, it's made for, for people who have sterner stuff, you know what I mean? So, but it's, but it's the most rewarding thing at the end of the day and it's the way of the world. So our third panelist um, is not here with us in person at JBDC, um, but he is here with us and so is the stock exchange with us um, all the time, um, certainly intellectually, they share with us a number of, 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 vi of the same vision that we share as JBDC. You know I mean? uh, we are very close with many persons who work at the Jamaica Stock Exchange. I personally know Andre for a very, very long time um, b b before he became uh, uh, the person he is at the Jamaica Stock Exchange. But to share with us the perspective of the JSC and certainly the JSSE as well, and the work that the Stock Exchange has been doing in the social enterprise sector space, I invite Andre Gooden from the Stock Exchange to share with us. Andre, your time. Thank you very much, Chairman. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, panelists. I don't know how you make me speak after those two big presenters, but um, I will do the best that I can. Um, in fact, Dr. Knife could have given, either one of my the two previous presenters could have given my perspective because Dr. Knife, both of them work very closely with us um, at the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange, at the Jamaica Stock Exchange. But um, I, I, I'm here representing and um, pointing out that the Jamaica Stock Exchange, as everyone knows, is an enabler of wealth creation generally for, um, for the country. Um, we spent, spend a lot of time, have spent a lot of time in that space, the, the, the private sector developing, uh, mobilizing capital for businesses and um, creating wealth. In doing so, we realized the importance of a foundation in business and a foundation among the youth in terms of education and uh, understanding of markets, how markets work and formalizing economies. And we've also given ourselves a, um, 
roll out a footprint of corporate social responsibility. That got to a point where we realized, as Dr. Knife said, that the foundations on which any vibrant economy is going to grow is based on development of its social fabric and in development of its youth. So with that in mind, um, we, in 2019, launched the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange. But even before I reached there, the Jamaica Stock Exchange in and of itself has a very intensive school education program that has been very, very active and it forms a big part of our corporate social responsibility where we go into schools, we speak about entrepreneurship, we speak about investing, we speak about social partnership and we speak to the youth about innovation, which is something I know is also near and dear to JBDC and the panel. And with all of that said, um, out of this came the need to develop a more formal structure for social enterprises. What we found is that social enterprises have great opportunities, great ideas, and they have always struggled with access to capital, access to formalization of structure. I mean, you have, let's take an example of a youth club that is putting an environmental project into an inner city. They go around to the churches, they go around to the schools and communities and the, um, and the immediate access to the, the people who they have immediate access to for donations, for support, tangible, um, whether it is financial support or in kind to get whatever project it is started. And they do that quite successfully. I mean, very successfully. But what happens after a year or a second year or a third year where other needs now evolve, um, there's no sustainability because the organizational structure in place may, may transition the, lead, the youth community leader might leave the community and go get a job somewhere else, go on to UA, go on to UTEC, and he's no longer there to, he or she is no longer there to chart the course. So things start to fall apart and there is no continuity to develop these social programs. Um, so we saw that need and we formed the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange in January, 2019, launched by the Prime Minister at our Capital Markets Conference with the sole intention of using the same template that we have now for the Jamaica Stock Exchange, which you may know is, is very firm on governance, is very firm on procedure, and is very firm on accountability. So what we have done is use that same template to attract um, social projects who are in need of long-term sustainability. Um, DEFCAN has been mentioned. DEFCAN is a first, one of the first companies listed on Jamaica Social Stock Exchange. They came to us with the idea. They, they completed an application process. Our listing committee reviewed the application, checked off the boxes to make sure all was in place, make sure they have a governance structure in place, make sure they have a financial plan in place, a business plan, an operational plan. And Knife can tell you about that because he was a big part of it. And then they got a disbursement um, which, which, which we raised from a private sector entity, um, which is now being used to develop agricultural products for commercial use with the proceeds going right back into the deaf community to service and grow the deaf community. It creates employment among the deaf community. And it is very innovative. Knife is into the program up to his elbow, up to his knee, up to his throat. So he can tell you some more about it. But that was the idea to really take social programs and turn them into businesses. And this JS, Jamaica Social Stock Exchange plan is a twofold plan. Um, the first one is the Jamaica social investment market, which is the stage we're at now, where we solicit um, private donations or public donations for specific projects put on by certain enti organized entities, and we carry the program through to ensure that there is in fact results, that there's a social, measurable social impact, which can lead to greater employment, greater responsibility, more uh, environmental awareness. Um, Knife mentioned economic, social, and environmental. We're focusing on those as well. And to give opportunities for individuals to 
monetize their dreams and turn them into, into enterprises that can withstand. And then they can have the option in phase two to transition into what we call this, the Jamaica impact investment market. The first market is a JSIM, Jamaica social impact. Then the Jamaica, and, and then the JIIM is the investment impact, where now you're actually investing to get <coughs> a return for your shareholders on your investment in this project, which is now maturing into an enterprise in and of itself. So that is the strategy. We, we do have a focus on youth. We do have a focus on using the template that the J Jamaica Stock Exchange has to roll out programs like this. Um, we have a website, Jamaica Social Stock Exchange has a website where anybody who has a, a, a project that they believe, any entity that has a project that they believe could use sustainable financing in an organized structure, you are free to go onto the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange website, complete the application process. We will call you in, go through it, uh, review it, tell you where its shortfalls are, what we think you should do, then we'll forward it to our listing committee who will decide if this is an entity that is this project that is worthy of listing. After it is listed, then we go to the public and say, look, we have this thing listed. We need to raise $10 million to do this project. This is the business plan. This is the sustainable development goals. This is the impact it will have on the community, on the country, on GDP, et cetera. And using our marketing tools and our marketing prowess, we encourage investors in these investments in these particular projects. If I could be allowed to share a little screen here, um, it's something we, we, we use, a, a template that we use to attract an interest. Are you seeing? Yes, yes. yes okay. When, when persons are coming to us to, um, for an opportunity, this, this, this was developed by our chairman, Neville, Neville, Professor Neville Ying, how to create a business plan for your project. All of us have good projects, you know. all of the entities out there have good social enterprise projects. Um, they just need some direction. One of the first things we do is give them these five questions because what we have to do, these 10 questions, beg your pardon, what we have to do is package your project, package your, 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 intent, your intention of your program into um, something marketable that investors will be interested in donating their funds to in the social investment market. So you come to us and say, you know, we need to organize this thing in this way and this is our business plan. We go through the plan and say, these are the things that we need to see in there. One, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Is it unemployment? Is it violence among youth? Is it an environmental problem, et cetera, et cetera? What are the solutions you're offering? And we assist you to identify what your solutions are. What are the strategic actions that will be needed to implement your solutions? What is the impact? Number four, what is the impact of your strategic actions? Five, who will be responsible for delivering the strategic action? This, this now speaks to your organization structure. What resources will you need to effect your solutions? That could be your business plan, your financial plan, your human resources plan, et cetera. Number seven, what is your track record of success to date? Now, this, is, this one raises some eyebrows because if you're trying to really start something to get to a certain point, you may not have a track record yet. We can assist you in putting something together based on the personalities involved, what have they done personally, what have they done academically, what have they done professionally, which brings them to this point where they can make a contribution to this particular effort. How are your goals aligned with those of your investors? This is critical now, um, Harold, because we can identify donors out there, but you have to have in many cases, an emotional appeal because don do donors in this phase of the plan are not looking for a return on their investment. They're appealing, we're appealing to their, to their social and emotional side 
in getting them to participate in such progress, such projects. And of course, it's good for their own corporate social um, opportunities to, to, in the communities in which they live, work, and um, do business that they participate in these programs. So you would approach a company that is in your community, who employs people in your community, who would have a vested interest in the community. And you, ask, you, you make sure that your project says how the goals are aligned to those from whom you're trying to get the support. And of course, you have to have the value proposition for the, benef the beneficiaries and the value proposition to, again, the donors and investors. If you, we go through this process, we come up with a proper marketing package to put these projects together, to bring them to the market. And we have regular reporting on the progress of these projects so that the, the investors, the donors can see tangibly where, uh, what return is showing up in the market on their investment. Whether it is a social return in, in phase one or a, or a financial impact or a, you know, a global impact in, in, in phase two. So the role of the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange really is to formalize social investing, social enterprising by bringing in matching investors with projects that are worthy. And we ensure the worthiness of the project by attracting quality governance to these projects using our own resources and the resources available through the communities and through um, our partners we, we work with JSIF, Jamaica Social Investment Fund. We work with United Way. We work with academia. We work, we have a, a wide range of resources under the umbrella of the Jamaica Stock Exchange, which we call on to formalize this market. So the youths that have ideas of, uh, for a social enterprise, I encourage you to go to the JSSE website, jsscja.com, and you can get a template, download the information that we require from you to put your project together to seek to, to be uh, listed, to become part of the social stock exchange. And we will hold your hand, we'll walk closely with you through the process. We have JBDC on board already. If you have want help with your business plan, if you want help, I mean, just to go to them and ask them if this idea is viable beyond a year or two, or if this is something I should just do as a crowdfunding fundraising activity or just turn it into a social enterprises. JBDC can help you make those decisions. We can help you as well. And we call on the resources that we have available in the Jamaica Stock Exchange group of companies. Remember, we have an e-campus as well, which we assist with capacity building. We are in the schools teaching youngsters about entrepreneurship. And we bring it all together so that the Jamaica Stock Exchange group is not just focused on economic development but also on the so developing the social fabric of our country. And coming soon, we're, we're, we're going to be involved in a very big project, a very big environmental project where we hope by the end of next year, we will be listing green bonds on the market where we will be identifying environmental projects that need financing and match the investors with those projects and do the same thing that we're doing with social stock exchange. So, Thank you very much. Um, I'm here to continue to listen and to learn from all the panelists and look forward to further participation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andre. And just to point out to our listeners that in terms of the investor readiness for our social entrepreneurs, JBDC is kind of in the role of helping with the deal flow towards the investors that will be looking to invest in our social enterprises. Um, a very enterprising move, a very innovative move, and, and, and Andre didn't show off to say that I think this social stock exchange is the only one in the region by far, I, I, I gather, in terms of we are ahead of it. We are ahead of everybody else. Isn't that so, Andre? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. You must show off, man. It's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> At this time, I want to invite um, our friend from the British Council, Damien, to share with us, as I said at the introductory, in the introductory remarks, the British Council doing some really good work in the social enterprise space, as it, oh, in, in particular, as it relates to work with students in high schools and so on. Um, so, Damien, can you share with us? 
Thank you very much. Um, uh, just giving some background to how the whole agenda of social entrepreneurship started for uh, the British Council in Jamaica. Um, we, as you know, British Council is a cultural relations organization and we engage through our work mainly young people. Um, seeing that they are usually the agents of change and we are trying to, to create lasting impact um, around the world. Um, when we come closer home, uh, looking at the high unemployment rate for young people at the time, much higher than now, around about 2016-17, we saw where uh, social enterprise creates opportunities for, for young people um, from disadvantaged backgrounds, um, facing different social issues. Uh, it would allow them to open up their understanding to uh, the, the world from a more global context, to understand that uh, even though I'm from a particular community, um, a particular parish, I'm more connected with the world than I think because of my innovative ideas and how these ideas can help to, to serve other populations through business. And that is uh, a unique context that we thought necessary to bring to the fore in terms of helping young people to understand that I can contribute to the development of Jamaica. Um, separate from that, we've been doing, uh, as Knife mentioned, um, uh, various uh, mapping reports in terms of the how sectors look in various countries across the world. And we thought it necessary because of the agenda of the government to um, bring social enterprises formally into, into what we're doing as a country for national development. Um, we embarked on the um, social enterprise mapping report that sought to um, show the status of social enterprises here in Jamaica. And uh, that was about 2017-18 when we did that report. Um, what came out of that was uh, the fact that we, we understood that social enterprises at the time were mainly um, surviving from grants. They were support, uh, surviving from um, do donations and donors. And we know the, how far uh, we, the, the sector can grow from there and thought it necessary as early as possible to engage young people in understanding um, how viable the sector is. Um, so it, it goes beyond um, studying the various academic programs um, or subjects that you will enter into in the, at a high school, but you can uh, understand that uh, all of these um, ideas and um, concepts that you learn in, in high school can come together to formulate a, a, a successful business. And that's where it really started uh, for us. And with the um, partnership with the, the Victoria Mutual Foundation, we saw it necessary to engage young people across high schools through a pilot program, um, seeing that before we had conducted a research, we we're, um, were very much guided by you know, data that is on the ground and relevant to the context that we're working with. And uh, seeing that you know, schools already have clubs and societies that are creating a lot of social impact, um, but seeing that th there are a lot of characteristics that connect strongly with, with you know, full-fledged businesses. Uh, so we need to help um, young people and uh, various stakeholders to connect that dot at the level of young people for, for us to you know, achieve much more growth and much more impact. Um, so we have gone through the process of engaging young people around understanding the, the, the concepts that we've built out in a social enterprise pack that was um, developed by the British Council and um, Social Enterprise Academy in the UK, um, around six concepts that students will need to participate in various activities, pulling on the skills that they are learn, learning through various subjects in high school, understanding that these ultimately contribute to the business um, that you eventually um, run or even the organization that you eventually get employed in. Uh, we're not saying that everybody has to run their own businesses, but you will definitely have to use these concepts to um, uh, deliver your responsibilities in whatever organization you might be employed. And what we've seen from that is uh, just a strong, um, strong drive from the young people who we engage that this is an era that I did not look on it like this before. 
I understand, yes, that there are social problems. One, I, I didn't understand that these problems, I really can contribute to solving them. That's coming from uh, evaluation of the program and feedback from young people. Um, I didn't know that I um, could um, come up with an idea that could help my community. I did not even understand that you know, I could start a successful business at an early age. Uh, we sought to give um, the young people ideas and examples of what's happening across the world with young people solving these problems and, and, and you know, making profits from, from what they're doing. And we're seeing where um, from that young people have acquired the relevant core skills, um, some of which the Ministry of Education has been promoting over the years around problem solving, around um, digital literacy, what is so, that is so important today, um, effective communication, some core skills that are needed in any setting that you're operating as an individual in a 21st century. And we build that as a foundation of activities that young people need to participate in. And what we've seen um, evolve from that is that young people now have become um, more, um, more developed in terms of their maturity around um, ideas and issues that are around them. They're much more uh, forward thinking, much more um, strong in terms of their leadership qualities, understanding that I'm a part of this process. And, and that's the reality that we have been really trying to um, help young people to understand. Uh, from that approach, uh, we, the, the intention is that these skills that young people would have um, learned and also implemented in their social enterprises that they run in their institutions um, that we've been supporting them with, uh, it, it really eventually um, contributes to them uh, starting successful social enterprises uh, when they go out into the work world. So, so that's one of the main in, um, objectives of the program to really get young people to, to understand that they can start these businesses as early as they want with the skills that they would have acquired. Um, I think one of the critical things that we need to consider and what we've learned from the program so far is the fact that uh, the ecosystem that we are building out really, uh, as was said before, uh, requires the participation of all uh, concerned. And what we've sought to do uh, because of social entrepreneurship education is first help uh, the, the teachers to understand the concept. Um, uh, what we've seen come from that is that the teachers themselves are motivated to start their own social enterprises and to have an additional income. Um, and then being able to also pass on and support young people to acquire those skills and also come up with uh, very good programs that will help their school community and uh, the wider community that, that they operate in. Uh, giving some examples of uh, some of the schools that we, we worked with. Uh, we have in the program, Charlie Smith High School. And we, we've asked the kids to, what are your talents, your natural aptitude, um, natural skills that you have a passion for? And what came out understandably was music. And from that, the young people started a band that you know, they were able to sell their services at various events and use those resources to um, support the needs of other young people in the school. What we realized came from that, the attendance rate for these young people increased, which means that they will have more opportunities to learn more in the classroom, which means that they have more opportunities to engage um, more young people in the classroom setting and also be exposed to other young people from other areas in the island that they would have not have naturally connected with, understanding the more global context that they're operating with and the prospects that are there for them. So um, all in all, the, the, the social enterprise sector for young people is, is viable. We're establishing that. We've tested and proven that it works. Um, it requires the, the support from various stakeholders. And that's why we have been really working strategically with the Ministry of Education because while with resources we can engage some and not all of the institutions across Jamaica, we'll need to have um, the, the, the social enterprise 
curriculum being built into the existing entrepreneurship um, curriculum for the Ministry of Education that will allow more young people or all young people in high schools to benefit from those skills that um, they can gain through the social entrepreneurship agenda. And from that, the, the examples that we have tested and proven will naturally come forward as um, uh, you know, lasting, a uh, lasting effect on young people across Jamaica, and, and that will naturally be propelled and the impact will be widened across, across Jamaica. So those are some of the strong things that we want to push. And the fact that um, through social entrepreneurship education for young people, it also means that education is not left or alone to um, the ministry and technical experts and teachers. It means that um, the, the businessmen around Jamaica can show uh, and teach young people some of these skills that they would have acquired that you would not get in a textbook because you'll see the live examples of how people are operating um, social enterprises around Jamaica and they also learn from that extent. So there are a couple of things that from, from there that we really want to continue pushing forward. Um, Jamaica is getting much much more attention from the global, um, uh, from, the, from other countries around the world, around social enterprise. And we just want to continue building on that impact as it will reap the benefits as we, as we progress. Thank you very much, Damien. Um, lots of good work, British Council. I mean, we have been engaged very closely with the British Council for many, many years. Um, more recently, um, regarding social entrepreneurs, social enterprise, and also creative and cultural industries, which you'll hear much more about later in this week of uh, where we celebrate Global Entrepreneurship Week. Now, as the final member of our panel, we left the youngest of the um, panel <laughs> persons to speak. Um, uh, Sir Etsy Small is the managing director for Avant Academy of Music seven years in the business of being a full, full on social entrepreneur, social enterprise. And Seretz is gonna share with us some of his journey and also maybe some tips and some lessons that he has learned along the way um, um, as, as, as he strives to be the global leader in this space. Mr. Small, it's over to you. Global leader in the space of um, social enterprise um, um, in music and what it is that you do specifically. So go ahead, sir. Thank you, Harold. I was just listening to all that went before and I was just thinking, wow, what an amazing ecosystem. You know, there are so many spaces and uh, I can't speak to the, the depth and the breadth of the spaces, but I can speak from my own experience on what we are doing at Avant Academy of Music. But is people and profit. I have always had a sense of mission. I am Gene Small's son. Dr. Gene Small, who is a theater person and a, an advocate for culture and for people. And I grew up around that. You know, I grew up around identity issues and Rasta and music and, you know, for free black people, free black people mine and that kind of thing. And when I thought it was time for me to take my turn at bat, um, in the 80s, the music industry changed. All of a sudden, the whole heap of people with purpose left the building. And I was faced with people who were drug dealers and ganja men in the studio in the 80s. And I was also faced with the fact that the music started to become computerized. And I couldn't manage it. I couldn't manage this, this new approach. Between the corruption and the fact that I was being asked to partner and to do business with people who don't share my values and possibly would get me in jail. 
and the music was moving away from horn section and you know composition and all of a sudden there was this thing called midi and it was clock and timing and you know i said no sir and so i started to wait and this is from yeah from even before bob died i started looking and waiting for an opportunity and my first opportunity came I was in the church, I became a Christian um, or a, a churchian at a certain point in my, in my journey. And I became very active in teaching and I formed a small business doing that. And that was very purpose driven. Later on, after I moved out to the churchian phase, and that's another story. I started a music publishing company that was focused on copyright and markets and developing and helping Jamaican people to have global opportunities. But in everything that I did, there was this purpose. I wanted to improve the quality of life, but there was just no support in the society for it. You talk to people about it, and the man them kind of look upon you strange. And I'm just saying, no, man, just make some money. And they're proposing a lot of corrupt things to me on the side to do in order to make the money. And I'm saying, boy, I know, but you know, how, how is this possible? So after many, many years, and, with, and this journey, this, this story is decades long we're talking. You know, with, I'm now in my 40th kind of year, my fourth decade of doing this thing. And it was when I started Avant Academy of Music, I was very fortunate that I had an angel investor, a man from abroad who had a similar vision for quality of life and music education and race and class and education and equity and you know, these, these concepts. So Avant means ahead of, in front of progression, you know, innovation. So whatever we were going to be doing, we're going to be causing that for our people. And with that angel investor, we went on the journey, but I did not know the term social enterprise at this point. It was still quality of life and how we could do a business. And I knew that it could not be a charity. I was asked that question, we just do it. I said, no, 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 no. If you do that, you get put in a box where you're being asked to manage crumbs what left, if you have the time, if it come to my consideration, I can't manage it. So I said, it has to be a for-profit business. And it was through the Jamaica National Social Enterprise Boost Initiative. Now somebody gave me a, you know, said, this thing is happening, blah, blah, and I applied to it and I got involved with the accelerator program. And when I heard about the, the people and profit, no man, it's like decades unravel and I said this is the thing this is the thing I am now free to not apologize for my purpose and at the same time pursue profit so my take on it was it's a business that has more than one bottom line and I'm gonna ask you why I did this for and it must be to make money and to you know, have a girl and have car and have house and all these things, profile, you know, be able to hang out. No, <laughs> we can make money, but there's another bottom line or another or two other bottom lines. Or how many bottom lines? We chose two, which was we're going to make money so that we can be sustainable and we can live good and pay people good salaries and, you know, do what we have to do with the right resources. And we also are going to change people's lives. And what we want to do is to make sure that people are certified, that they're developed for the workforce, and that they have no sense of shame and humiliation because of the color of their skin, or how them stay, or how them talk, or that they have a sense of love and belonging. Right? So we push everything to that. And what I would say to a young person, and we were, you know, we were having this conversation about young people and social entrepreneurship. Sometimes you can get confused with the charity notion. And that can stick with you. 
where you think, um, I'm going to do this cause, I'm going to have this heart, but somehow I'm going to organize my business at the same time, or somehow I'm going to formalize it. I don't recommend that. My perception is make sure that you are committed to monitoring your bottom lines. My bottom line is profit and social impact, which means that every management meeting that I have with my team, every meeting I have with my staff, my teachers or my admin staff, I ask them, I said, what are we doing today to improve our net worth? And what are we doing to not only impact person's lives, but to have a record of that impact? We need to measure, not only measure, but we must recognize that we must report on what we measure. So we have put in quarterly reporting in all of our operations. So everybody has to learn how to use PowerPoint. Everybody has to learn how to speak because it no make no sense. We're doing this work and we cannot report on it. I want all of my staff members to not only be able to say that they work at Avanti Academy Music and that it is a social enterprise, but they should be able to also report on it from where they are, on their KPIs, on what we're achieving and so on. And so I think about alignment, I think about the purpose, but I also think about that measurement. And if you can get committed to that, and then just say to yourself, you know what? Being, running a social enterprise, and not only running a social enterprise, but building a social enterprise in all of its systems and procedures and so on, the culture, I make the commitment daily to be a leader and a coach. I will be the one to nurture the purpose and to nurture our people so that we all come up together. So those are kind of my broad thoughts on it um, in relation to social enterprise. All right, Bossy. <laughs> very well done, sir, it's this one. Um, and, and very important, the whole business of measurement. Um, I believe it was either Knife or Olivia who spoke earlier about the whole business of accountability and the fact that really for social enterprise, the accountability factor cannot turn up. It's even more so than the for-profit enterprise because for a for-profit enterprise in the main, you're mostly accountable to your shareholders and the immediate stakeholders around you. But if it is that you're embarking on a social enterprise, a sustainable social enterprise, the accountability framework is extremely important. And the measurement framework that accompanies that accountability framework is also very important. And, as, and, and here's where I want to kick off our conversation. I'm not too sure what time it is and how much time we have for, for questions and answers, if we have any at all. But I want to kick off our conversation by talking to our panelists about the whole business about the importance of accountability. Um, and I'm going to start with Knife, simply because I know that he has put in some measurement and accountability. He has been looking at the measurement and accountability framework um, for social enterprises and what is important. But I believe that even as you start out as, as young entrepreneurs, it's important for us to have that in the back of our, our heads as we pursue a social enterprise. Knife, what's your thoughts on that? Let me just again start by saying the, the, the work in the social entrepreneurship space started when we're looking at community safety and security and promoting social inclusiveness using a sustainable model. But importantly, we're saying you have to juxtapose what will be the return on investment if you are investing in a social enterprise or if you're going to invest in something else because it can't just because of a feeling you want to invest in the, the social enterprise. And it is important to monetize. So when I bring you speaking from Avanti, I'm now saying to myself, I wonder if I'm really monetize these things. Meaning now, 
do you calculate the social rate of return on the investment that you have made? When you look at what you have used as the input, and then you look at the outcome and the impact, when somebody has gone through your program, and they have now developed that skill set, and then can move on, and you do the tracer, yes? And it might cost you $10,000 to bring him through the program, but at the end of that program, that person is worth $10 million. You know, do we recognize that for every dollar that you have spent, you might have created $10 worth of value. So the monetization becomes very important, especially when you don't have no resources. So if a private sector man wants the money, the regular businessman wants the money, and you're a social enterprise person wants the money, what do you use to make that objective decision? It must be the rate of return on the alternative investments. So I don't want people to say because he's my friend while I'm investing. And usually you'll find that the social return on investment tends to be much, 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 much higher than a traditional ROI. And the impact is more crucial. Why is it more crucial? Because it's no longer a trickle-down model, you know. You find that your enterprise might be directly located in the community that you're serving or in close proximity to the community that they're actually serving. So we say it, is, it endogenizes the growth process faster than any other kind of system. So we have some of these tools. You know, we have tools that look at A, your capacity to absorb. So we have a governance index where we can assess your organization to see if you get a particular score we say, yes, this person can get the funding and can utilize it prop properly. Or you need capacity building. And if we, don't, if we do the, the SROI with the, and the governance, we could say, okay, they can use this funding to generate what we want to be generated, and it justifies it. So the measurement tools are crucial. I have to use the proxies because you might have your organization and you're teaching these youths, and what you're charging for enrollment in the session is way below what the market price actually is, and there's nothing wrong with that. But you must use the market price as a proxy to get a true understanding of what you're actually creating